And so, in the few years that I was involved with the NDP, I got to know, I got to know him quite well and his wife, and then peripherally I got to observe the sorts of things they were doing at provincial conventions and national conventions and that sort of thing. With, because when those conventions came up, he would be associating with some of the premiers of provinces at that time, like Roy Romanow and, and the leader Ed Broadbent, and then a number of the leaders of the sort of national labor unions. And it was pretty interesting to observe them, because a lot of them were committed people, and they did have the interests of the working class person in mind, I would say. But then, when I was just associating with the party hacks, I suppose, in general, it was a whole different issue, because most of them, as far as I could tell, weren't driven by care, they were driven by resentment. And my experience as a clinical psychologist has taught me that the two most pathological emotions, or the two most destructive emotions, I think you can, you can or attitudes, because I'm not sure they're exactly emotions, is resentment and arrogance. And resentment seems to be something like the observation that the world is not a fair place, but worse than that, that it's not a fair place in a manner that's particularly unfair to you. Because it's obvious that the world isn't a fair place. It's predicated, you know, it, the world is a tragic place. And there's justice. If there's any justice, it's imperfect justice. And you might think, well, how can you not be resentful under those conditions? But, and I think that's a powerful argument. How can you not, or a powerful question, how can you not be resentful under those conditions? But I can tell you that all it does is make it worse. And it's an interesting, it's a very interesting form of worse because people justify their resentment against the system or against being itself, for that matter, by rationalizing to themselves the fact that it's so clearly unjust that, that having any admiration or support for it, it verges on the pathological. But the problem with that is that as soon as you adopt that attitude, you start to act in ways that make the conditions that you were originally objecting to much worse. So then, instead of being at least neutral with regards to the problem, you're accelerating and strengthening the original issue. And I really think that's true with resentment. And Nietzsche actually wrote a fair bit about resentment. He called it ressentiment, I think, is, if, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes? Well, it's a good question, because, you know, that definitely happens. That's a problem in psychotherapy. You, you often have someone who has a chip on their shoulder, which is one way of thinking about it, you know. And part of it is to disabuse them of the notion that anyone escapes from that. You know, because one of the... One of the things that I think drives class hatred, insofar as that's still a relevant phenomena, and I think it's still quite relevant, is that people who people have strange ideas about who's rich and who's poor, first of all, especially in North America, because most North Americans think that anybody who has more money than them is rich. Right? When the fact of the matter is that everybody in North America is rich beyond belief compared to any reasonable historical standard, and that almost all the problems that can be solved with money, like with magnitude of money, have already been solved in North America. There's still problems of relative poverty, but that's a completely different issue. Relative poverty and absolute poverty are not the same problem, because relative poverty has to do with dominance hierarchy position, and absolute poverty has to do with privation. And the argument that there are people in North America who are in privation because they don't have money I think that's an incredibly unsophisticated and weak argument. They might be in privation, but the probability that that's because they don't have money, or the probability that money would fix that is virtually zero. So, for example, if you give... I've had plenty of clients in my practice, and the best times of their lives were when they had no money. Because as soon as they had any money, man, they were in serious trouble. Those were often people who were addicted to something or other, you know, like alcohol or cocaine. 
as soon as they got their unemployment check or, or even their employment check for that matter, they were gone for like four days. You know, and they spent every bloody cent of it and that was the end of that. And giving them more money was not going to fix the problem. And there's lots of people for whom having more money would not fix their problem at all. It's not that easy to figure out how to do sensible things with money and it also makes you a target for people to take advantage of you virtually instantaneously. You know, so the idea that the kind of poverty that characterizes North America is there because some people don't have money is just, that's just so, it's so unsophisticated an um, assessment. First of all, it assumes that poverty is homogenous and it's by no means homogenous. You know, I also grew up with working class kids and hardly any of them graduated from high school and virtually none of them went to university. A lot of them went off to work in the oil rigs, which was, you know, pretty damn um, spectacular from a perspective of money. They never had any money. They spent it all, you know, they'd go work in the bush for two weeks and they'd come out for four days or five days and spend, you know, $4,000 in the bars and that was the end of that and then they were back in the oil rigs, you know. Maybe they'd buy a car after working for a year or two, but they usually you know, and it lost their license because they were driving well impaired or wrapped the thing around a tree or something like that. There was no, the money in some sense had almost no utility for them because money isn't all that useful unless you know what to do with it. So, so back to the resentment issue, you know, Orwell's comment on, and it's like a psychoanalytic comment in some sense. One of the things the psych, that psychoanalytic thought is really, really useful for is that it always makes you ask a question, which is, where's the other half? So if someone says, I'm doing this and here's, and I'm doing it for good reasons and I'm a good person, then the, psychoanalytic, the psychoanalyst always asks, well, okay, where's the, where's, the, where's the other half of that? Like, is it projected onto someone else, which is almost always the case, or is it lurking around underneath causing some sort of trouble that the person doesn't want to admit to? Well, that's very, very frequently the case as well. And so Orwell's diagnosis for... Um, the moral insufficiency of left-wing socialists, utopian left-wing socialists in the United Kingdom was that they were just resentful, especially the intellectuals. And the reason they were resentful was because even though they were smart and privileged and well-placed, say, in universities and so on, there were lots of people around who had more money and theoretically more power than they did, and that was annoying, and so what they did to, to reconcile themselves to that was to pretend to be advocates for the working class, but all they were doing was masking their own resentment about being improperly rewarded by the power hierarchy. And I got, when I read that, and I wasn't very old, I were, was probably 17 or so when I read that, I thought, that's exactly right. He got it exactly right. Now, he wrote that book. The book was The Road to Wigan Pier which is a great book. And